a training institute we host called the Supporting Organizational Sustainability to Address Violence Against Women Institute, also known as the SOS Institute. You will receive emails that will notify you of additional webinars in this series. Upcoming topics include leading with emotional intelligence and coaching and peer mentorship. Today's webinar will run until 11 o'clock a.m. Pacific time. During the webinar, your phone line will be muted. You may ask a question or report a technical issue using the chat function on the right of your screen. I want to point out a couple of the features that we will be using today. Closed captioning is provided in today's presentation. Captions will appear in the box on the bottom of your screen. You have the ability to scroll up and down in this box. Please note that when you manually scroll through the text, the auto scroll will be disabled. To re-enable the feature, please click on the auto scroll box located on the upper right corner of the captioning box. At the end of the presentation, we will have question and answers. Please feel free to type questions into the question and answer box throughout the presentation. The box is located on the right-hand side of your screen. We will do our best to answer the questions by the end of the presentation. Um, if we're not able to, we will happily um, contact you as well at the conclusion <clears throat> of the presentation. There is also a chat box that may be used for comments and to send private chat messages for technical support. By clicking the chat box drop-down menu on the upper right corner of that box and choosing the Start Chat with Host option. You can also call 1-800-422-3623 for Adobe Tech Support. There is another box with several links to resources on self-care and another box with handouts that can be downloaded, which you will see on the screen. At the end of the webinar, you will be prompted to answer a short evaluation. Please do take a moment to complete the evaluation. We really do pay attention to those comments. Um, and we do utilize the suggestions for the future. Um, as a reminder, a recording to today's webinar and a PDF version of the PowerPoint slides will be available on our website after the presentation. <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, today's webinar is part of a series that we are providing under the SOS Institute. The Institute was created in 2010 and offers an interactive two-and-a-half-day training as well as ongoing technical assistance for OBW grantees to enhance their organizational infrastructure. Participation for the Training Institute is built around teams of three to four individuals from the same organization, which may include the executive director, board members, and program staff. We cover a broad range of topics from aligning your mission and core values to effective collaborations to staff development. <clears throat> we have an extraordinary team of faculty with us today who are veterans in organizational sustainability. Given that they have either founded, have led, or are leading various organizations. And we also have one of our faculty members here with us today, Becky Masaki. Becky is the Senior Program Director of the Asian Pacific Institute on Gender-Based Violence. She co-founded Asian Women's Shelter in San Francisco and served as the founding executive director for over 28 years. Jolene Joseph is the executive director founder of the Native Wellness Institute. Jolene is an enrolled member of the Grovant or Ahani people from Fort Belknap, Montana. Jolene shares her passion for being positive, productive, and proactive. We also have with us Father Jeff Putoff, President of St. John's Jesuit High School and Academy in Toledo, Ohio. Prior to that, he founded the nonprofit HopeWorks, working with youth 14 to 23 who were not in school for over 19 years. He enjoys speaking nationally on trauma-informed care and organizational life. Um, our objectives for the webinar today are that we hope as a result of this you will be better able to identify how individual, organizational, and work-related factors contribute to an individual's experience of secondary trauma or compassion fatigue and ability to heal from it, to discuss the reasons organizations benefit from supporting an environment where employees practice self-care, and share ideas for how to support self-care at work and create an organizational climate that prioritizes individual health and wellness. Um, before we get started with our faculty, just wanted to quickly mention a little bit about the ideas um, behind this webinar. Um, we are 
taking the day to talk about self-care in the workplace um, with an understanding that self-care really matters at work, particularly in the type of work that you as OBW grantees engage in, as helpers, as caregivers, as advocates. Um, we all can suffer at times from what's known as compassion fatigue or similarly vicarious trauma, secondary trauma, um, or burnout. And compassion fatigue is defined here by the American Bar Association on your slides as a cumulative physical, emotional, and psychological effect of exposure to these traumatic stories or events that we all engage with on a daily basis in the work that we do as helpers, as advocates, um, as people who are out in the field assisting others. Um, you could take a quick look um, at some of the signs, and these signs can affect individuals and organizations. Um, so if you take a look at the organizational side, you might see uh, organizations that are suffering from compassion fatigue, having high degrees of absenteeism, lack of cohesion, um, trouble with teamwork, or a lack of vision. And similarly, on the individual side, you may see um, individuals suffering from exhaustion, um, inability co to connect. Um, and a, a, a difficult time focusing on the meaning in their work. Um, so these are some of the signs, and we have provided some um, additional resources for you to look a little bit more about this. And for now, we're going to um, turn this over to our faculty, um, Father Jeff, and Father Jeff is going to speak a little bit more about his work with you. Father Jeff? Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, Hi, everybody. It's good to be here today. And so I want to just begin uh, with the notion of how we're going to change our perspective. And this slide is uh, uh, a view of planet Earth from Saturn. And as you can see, Earth looks really different when we have a different perspective. I mean, that's, that's what we look like, if you will. And so as we begin to think about um, trauma, trauma-informed care, and especially compassion fatigue and what toxic stress does to us, we're actually going to move into thinking about things from a different perspective. And to do this, I want to tell you a story about my time in Camden, New Jersey. Camden is America's course, most violent city of its size, right across from Philadelphia. I went there and was there for about 19 years. And during that time, I founded a nonprofit that was focused on working with youth who were not in school, 14 to 23. Uh, at some of our high schools, we had a 70% dropout rate. What we did was we ran a training program to help people get back in school by using technology and website design, GIS, and Salesforce. So we created businesses. We had clients. We could have jobs. People could get college credit. They could get back into school. And as we began to do this, we were very excited. Uh, one of the important things that we did was try to create an environment that was different than the environment outside on the street. So uh, three kind of quintessential things we had. Uh, we had a cat, so, you know, it was real furry and warm. We baked bread every day, so it smelled excellent. Uh, people ate the bread, but we did it actually just to try to make it really soft. And then we also had a, a waterfall inside. So I just say these things because... They were ways in which we were trying to create an environment that was different. We were in business for five, six, seven years, having a lot of success. And then quickly, I began to notice, and we began to notice something was happening to us. We really weren't sure what it was. What we saw, though, were the symptoms. And what I most remember was one day when our lead trainer went to the door, when someone came to the door, a young person, and they were late. And she opened the door, and she said to the person, listen, you're not taking this serious. Go home and come back in a month when you're able to take this serious. And she closed the door on the person. This was shocking, right? It was shocking because it's not how we understood we wanted to treat people. It wasn't how we had been working with people. And yet, something had happened to us. And so I remember we got the staff together, and we started talking and I said, well, how are is everybody? And obviously, this is over time, right? This is not just one story that did this. And people said, we're stressed and uh, we're upset. And what they said to me as the executive director and the founder was, I needed to do two things. I needed to hire more people, and they needed to work less. 
Well, obviously, we were about at 70% capacity at the time. That wasn't a solution that was going to work, but it was clear that people were having this experience, this deep, profound experience. So what we did was we moved into trying to study stress. We started a mental health commission. And the very first response was, we need to get rid of that which stresses us. So we're going to get rid of the youth. So that was sort of the solution was the youth stress us. We need less clients, right? We need less people. Well, obviously, we didn't do that. And we kept moving forward. We, our story kind of, we got into motivational interviewing and something called sanctuary. I could talk about that. You could ask me about that later. The important part is that we began to understand stress like radiation. And that's what this slide is about. That we were working in an environment where, in a sense, the nuclear reactor had cracked and it was radioactive. Stress is all around us. Just like radiation, you can't see it, but it impacts us. And we were being deeply impacted as an organization and we didn't have the language for it. Instead, we saw the symptoms of the impact in our staff. And you saw some of those at the very beginning where it says like the organization has high absenteeism or it gets aggressive amongst its staff. You have email wars, right? Like the emails that go around that are just full of rage. Um, you, come to the, you come to work and you sit in your car and you don't want to get out. You know, these are typical kind of responses to being in a environment that is full of toxic stress. So how did we come to understand that? Well, we need to understand that by looking at the ACEs, which stand for the Adverse Childhood Experience. And ACEs is the Adverse Childhood Experience Study. It starts with a doctor named Vince Folletti, who in, uh, was in San Diego in the 80s. He was running an obesity clinic. And he was helping people lose lots of weight through liquid. And this is one of his patients, Patty. And Patty went from 408 to 137 pounds. You see her here, right? And over time, what Vince, Dr. Folletti began to see was that his patients would lose a lot of weight and then they would disappear. And they oftentimes would come back having gained back a lot of weight. And he didn't understand this. He was very intrigued by this. They, they were losing lots of weight over time. But in a sense, there was something else going on. And he didn't quite understand how to think about this medically. So Patty became one of his seminal cases where she comes back in after losing all this weight and over one month has gained about 32 pounds. And Dr. Folletti and her have a discussion. And she says, Dr. Folletti, I think I have the night eat. And he goes, what's that? And she says, I wake up at, in the morning and my kitchen is a mess. It's clear someone has been eating. And I think I'm eating. Well, Dr. Folletti, at this time, one, you know, it was impossible almost to gain this much weight. And then listening to this, they began to ask, well, what's going on? What else is happening? So as you look at these pictures across the screen, you see Patty uh, when she has uh, 408 pounds, 137, and then as a small child. And we easily could say, where is she, you know, most unhealthy? Where is she most unsafe? And the reality for Patty believe it or not, is when she weighed 137 pounds. Because through conversation, what happened was Patty begins to identify that as she's working, people begin to ask her out. She was asked out on a date. Patty was a victim of sexual abuse. This had never been thought of before in terms of her weight, in terms of what had happened. Rather, Dr. Folletti saw her weight as simply the problem. For Patty, her weight was actually a solution to being abused. This is obviously, I'm truncating the story. Dr. Folletti begins to understand this. He begins to ask other patients about this. This was in the 90s. He says that many patients began to, to uh, name abuse in their life. This leads to Dr. Folletti creating the Adverse Childhood Experience Study. This study that ran from 1995 to 1997 engaged 17,000 people in his obesity practice. And it found some amazing results that actually we need to change from saying, why are you so heavy to what happened to you that being heavy would be helpful. So the pivot here for us in terms of compassion fatigue 
is to think not why are we so tired or why is all this behavior happening, but rather what's happening to us that this behavior actually makes sense. So we think about it like radiation, right? We're in a sense trying to understand the cause as opposed to dealing with the symptoms. Dr. Saletti says he began to realize that helping people lose weight was the equivalent of turning a fan on smoke and really fanning the fire. He wasn't dealing with really what was going on. So I know that we had asked you to actually take some questions on the poll. We have it right here. And if you want, you can go in there and answer some of these things. So you can see people are doing it. The really interesting thing will be what your A score is. And you don't have to reveal your A score. It's not important for us to know. What is important, though, to know is that you actually have a history with you. And we're going to talk about what happens when we bring our history to work, right? But first, let's look at some more of the ACEs here. Can you remove that uh, slide for me? So the three types of ACEs, how they were kind of characterized, that they did, remember this is back in the 90s, uh, they basically grouped it as abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. And there's 10 different ones. You see them here. And what you do when you take the ACE study is you actually say if you've had or you've experienced one of these. It's not the frequency of them, but rather it's the cumulative one. So you might say I was physically abused, I experienced mental illness in my household, and there was a divorce. That would be an ACE score of a three. It wouldn't mean, oops, it wouldn't mean that, oops, we're gonna go back there. <clears throat> Right, we need to go over here. All right. Uh, it wouldn't mean that if I had three experiences of being physically abused that I have an ACE score of three. Rather, it's different ones. That's how the ACE score works. So they began to simply quantify these through these 10 characteristics that seem to be shared with the people who were in the program there with Dr. Folletti. This is very important because obviously over time, these begin to change. This is the initial. <laughs> Here's what we see, which is absolutely amazing data. You can see here the, the frequency of the different uh, uh, adverse childhood experiences. And of the, of the 17,000 participants, one third basically had no A score. Another, another third roughly a third or 25%, or, or right, had one. And then the rest, 38% had two or higher, right? Now, why this is incredibly important is because when we experience ongoing toxic stress, it has results in our life. We understand this today, what I would call brain health. So when we live with toxic stress, it actually um, pickles our brain, if you will. Stress, good stress, we get nervous, we get um, excited, hyper-aroused because we see a snake, a car comes at us, we swerve, right? And then we re-regulate and we go back to sort of without stress or just normal, right? But it, when we experience ongoing toxic stress from adverse childhood experiences, we actually begin to live stressed all the time, not simply when we're having the experience. Rather, our brain begins to be stressed all the time. That ongoing experience of toxicity actually releases hormone or the hormones, the stress hormones like cortisol, for instance, actually release proteins that actually change our gene. And those experiences of changing our gene predispose us or dispose us uh, towards cancers. You see these things here, towards cancers, diabetes, heart disease, uh, stroke cardio issues, and whatnot. We now know after the study and through the last 20 years, the neuroscience is showing us that toxic stress as, is an environmental injustice. It's like a particulate matter that we would breathe in, that actually toxic stress is no different. 
that when we are in an environment like this, it will actually change our genes, it, not our genes, it, the gene reception, so that's called epigenetics. It will also cause us to develop other adaptive behaviors, and you can see some of these right here, right? We can measure this, and they can be correlated to the ACE score. So, for instance, when I was in Camden working, the young men in the program were scoring a 5.7 on their ACE score. It's, the statistics show that if you score a 6 or higher, you on average live 20 years less. These are statistics. This doesn't mean that that will happen to you. What it means is there's a probability of this, right? Now, the really good thing about this is we're learning we can do something with this. So the reason why we're starting with compassion fatigue and ACEs is because what happens to us is directly connected to the compassion fatigue we experience. So let me move on here. So again, we're thinking about changing the perspective from why, not why do you do what you do, but rather what happens, right? This is very important. So this old lady, right, seeing the young woman, the old woman, uh, is really important. It's like looking from Saturn, that how is it possible to see an old woman and then see, in another way, a young woman? This is what's needed when we begin to think about organizational vicarious trauma, compassion, fatigue for us. Otherwise, we just look at the symptoms. Here's an example. This is a famous football player named Adrian Peterson. In 2012, you might know about it, but you don't have to know a lot about football. He was terribly injured, tore up his knee. Uh, Ten months later, he comes back and he rushes for over 2,000 yards. That's amazing to do any time in football, let alone uh, when you've had a major injury. People said, well, how did you do this? And people say, wow, it was grit, hard work, determination, a big heart, all true. The person who he is and his personal character, absolutely. But I like to say there were three things that happened before any of that. And the first one is the most obvious, that when he fell to the turf, the picture you see, people came out and helped him. Now, it seems obvious. The folks that we work with do not have the same reaction. The young people in my town, in Camden, who experienced lots of adverse childhood experiences, which is like hurting their knee, except it's hurting their brain, the game doesn't stop. Rather, it'd be like trying to stay in the football game with a bad knee. Now, just imagine that. You have a bad knee, but no one knows you have a bad knee. They just see that you're running terribly now, and so you're a coach. What do you say? Run faster. Work harder. Run last. I'm going to put you on the second team. I might cut you. Or you might say, you used to be really good, or I saw some good in you, so maybe what I need to do is give you some more resources. So I give you a new offensive line, new guards, new blockers, right? We do both of these in our line of work. We actually resource people, housing, food, health care, education. We try to coach and mentor and train people, all of which is essential to a football team and which is essential to human development. What's being added here in today's conversation is that we also have to heal the brain that when the brain gets injured from exposure to toxic stress and we don't do anything about it, it's like having a football player in the game who's still injured. So again, we're changing the perspective. And I like this, this picture because even though I know after showing this picture so many times that there's an old woman and a young woman in it, I have a hard time seeing the old woman. And I like doing this because it's the same thing with the, the information that I'm sharing with you today and we'll share today, is just knowing the information doesn't mean that we're going to be able to change. It means that we actually have to work at it. We have to work at it. Now, why is it that we have to work at it? Because our brains are different. This is a great thing. If you've ever read this book called Zebras Have No Ulcers, what's really powerful about this is that, you know, the book says, well, if a zebra gets chased by a lion, what happens? It either becomes lunch or it gets away. If it gets away, it goes back and starts eating and just sort of a normal zebra thing, right? You and I get chased by a lion, one of two things happens. We get eaten or we get away. But what's different about us is that when we get away, we can continue to remember the lion. So in a sense, on this presentation right now, it's possible for some of us to actually experience being chased by a lion, even though there's no lion here. 
This is what's different about our brain. Now look at the little cartoon there. The difference between being mindful or re-regulation or, you know, when we want to say yoga or calm down, or a mind that's full of stuff, that's ruminating, that leads to us having reenactments. We oftentimes have reenactments at work. So because this, I like this little thing here because, it, you know, it's like plutonium or something, something radioactive. We go to work with our own history. And if we're not in touch with our own history, what happens is, is we share that history. Organizations are simply collections of brains. And those brains come together and they work together with their own history. In a space, we, you and I are working in a space that has lots of radiation. So we've learned adaptive behavior to toxic stress. If you have a high ACE score, if you have high ACE, if you've experienced uh, adverse childhood experiences, and then you go to work. I like to say it's like bringing your own plutonium to the party, right? Now, the good news is we can actually learn about this. We can learn about it through brain health. At HopeWorks, where I was working in Camden, we, we changed our program to begin to retrain the brain, both with our young people and with our staff. What we found, obviously, fight, flight, freeze, right? These are common ways that people respond when they feel unsafe. If you have a history of being unsafe and you come into an environment that's really nice, like baked bread and a cat and a waterfall, you still can be triggered. And this would happen all the time at HopeWorks. What would happen would be someone would, stand, would get really frustrated with the training and stand up and say, F you and storm out. And what we oftentimes would say would be like, Father Jeff, what did you say to Sam? He's so upset. We didn't understand what was going on, right? In a sense, what happened to us was we would experience something that was terribly painful, a reaction of somebody, and then we would try to make sense out of it without understanding radiation, without understanding toxic stress. So I had a board chair who worked at a behavior hospital. He told me this story one time. Someone came into one of the employees came into him and said, hey, I'm really tired. The patients are all been throwing up a lot. And they kind of went on for a while. And then Chuck, my board chair, said, hey, well, look, they're patients. That's what they do, right? And in a sense, that's why I like this picture, right? Vomit is a really good image. And I, I apologize if it's triggering to some people. Some people get can have a trigger to this. But it's really good because what happens is that when someone else gets sick and you actually smell the vomit, you yourself can get sick. And this happens. It's contagious. So when we get together, if we're not aware of what's going on and we don't know how to manage our own history or the environment that we're in, we're not taking precautions for that, then we very quickly can become overwhelmed. In a sense, Hope Works, my staff and myself, had become like an emergency room that got really frustrated when someone came in who was bleeding, right? This is an impact of, of, of um, uh, compassion fatigue, right? So let's change the subject here. How, what were some of the things that we did? Well, we really focused on uh, self-care. We did a number of things, self-care, safety plans, red, uh, red flag meetings, all sorts of stuff. But the one I want to talk to you about today was self-care. So we began to think about self-care in a way much like a bike tire. That if any of you have been on, ridden a bike and you have a low tire, you know how much more energy it takes to get from point A to point B. If you fill your tire up, you're able to get there in a really good way. We began to think about self-care much like this, that we needed to show up at work with our tire inflated. In order to do that, we actually created self-care plans with every employee. They were actually reviewed each time they met with their supervisor. In our case, once a week, we spent about five minutes. This is an example. What's on the screen right here is an example of my self-care plan. I created it, I named it Tipsy. And you can see it says time, thinking, inquisitive thinking, prayer, sleep, exercise. These are all things that I would try to do, one, two, three of them a day, to in a sense keep my tire inflated. I needed to do that because the environment that I was going into could be so difficult that I needed to be at optimal speed. So these were things that we hung around the office to remind people that there was air available. And the great thing was that it means that self-care becomes 
you know, the responsibility of each of us. It wasn't that I have to remove the stressors, which sometimes in the organization you have to, right? If you're working around radiation, you have to wear a dosimeter, have lead. You have to take care of your environment. That's what the organization can do. But it also needs people who show up with an inflated tire really well, right? So what I want to do real fast is actually show you something that I do. And this is, we're going to just try to do this virtually just for a couple minutes. And this is called alternative nostril breathing. Now, one of the things that we, we, I've learned is that you can try to breathe when you're stressed out. But really, what is going on in your brain over a series of years, right, especially if, if you experience ACEs as a young child or in your adolescence, is you fire and wired and create a lot of neural pathways. And you actually have to create new neural pathways. So I actually practice about five times a week, five minutes a day, alternative nasal breathing. I do that because I'm trying to build my capacity to be mindful, to stay in my rational brain and not go into my emotional brain, to create a capacity so that when I am in high stress situations, I have more ability, more air in my tire to respond, if you will. Right? This is a practice that is like building um, you know, muscle memory. I've also found it really helpful to do in meetings because I can actually do this while I'm sitting in the meeting if I get frustrated. So here's what we do. So I want everybody to place, to place your finger, okay, on your nose, all right, on, on the right side of your nose, and close your nostril, and breathe in, and now breathe out. Move your, move your finger over to the left. In. Out. And just alternate back and forth. So in. Out. In. out and continue the practice and what you're doing is you're breathing in you're breathing out and you're alter you're going back and forth between your nostrils continue just continue and take as deep breath as possible and then just let it out and continue Father Jeff, I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to interrupt you because we are a little bit we're Absolutely. a little bit over. So if Absolutely. you could just um, say your yeah, I'm final couple right comments. Now. So, all right. So now just plug your nose and hold your breath. No, no, no. So the whole point is is that you're actually trying to create a capacity. This is one small example of what was in my own self care plan because some days the roads look like this, right? You show up at work and you need to be able to be prepared for it. So the conclusion of what I'm saying is simply ACEs allows us to understand that there's an injury that we're dealing with, both in, our, in the people in front of us, sometimes in our own life, and they come together in organizational life. And the key axis that we need to work on is to move from why to what happened, to change our perspective, to understand the power of toxic stress, and to become aware the great hope here is that we can actually retrain our brains. Injured brains don't have to stay injured, but we have to retrain them, just like we have to do PT when we get a new knee or new shoulder. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Father Jeff. Um, thank you so much. And we're going to transition over um, to hear from Jolene Joseph from the Native Wellness Institute. Thanks, Jennifer. And thank you for that great presentation, um, Father Jeff. That was, that was great. So, um, as Jennifer said earlier, my name is Jolene Joseph, and I want to give a shout out to um, all my friends and colleagues. I saw some names go by on the um, participant list out there. So, um, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. The work that I do is with tribal communities across uh, North America, and um, in relation to the ACEs study, what that has really done is put 
um, a spotlight, if you will, on the impacts of historical and intergenerational trauma, and in particular with um, the Native community that, that I work with. And um, some of the work that we do, or all of the work that we do actually, when we address historical trauma, the flip side of that is his, the historical wisdom or the healing piece that comes in because healing is the answer to trauma and it's a huge part of our self-care um, personally and in the workplace. So we use lots of tools to help us with our self-care. And you see on the slide here, um, when we talk about self-care, it's taking care of ourselves physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And by doing that, of course, it's helping us live in balance. So I'm going to share some tools um, that we can use to do that. And more importantly, we have to really understand why self-care is so important. And so there's a teaching that just talks about you know, we can only give what we have. We can only give what we have. So when we're going around with a flat tire, as the example um, was just shared, then then that's what we're giving the people that we're, that we're being of service to, the women and the children and the families um, that we're serving. And in this particular arena of um, working with domestic violence and sexual assault, um, that work, as, as we just heard, you know, contributes to compassion fatigue and vicarious trauma and things like that. And it's also a movement, in my, in my opinion, that is very much filled with violence um, because we talk, we talk about the oppression and the lateral oppression that happens and um, we have things coming at us from, from every angle, which then makes it even more important to um, take care of ourselves. So, if we move to the next slide, um, <clears throat> so this handout is just um, what we call Native Wellness, and it's just a model that helps us to live in balance. So you see on here the four quadrants that make up our personal well-being. So you can see the physical, the mental, the emotional, and the spiritual. I'm not, I'm not going to read every single um, example. You can take a look at those. But what this does is it helps us um, look at things in each of these quadrants. And we can, and there's another handout later I'm going to share that helps us to assess our own sense of well-being. And these are just a few examples. You know, we could have way more examples in each of the quadrants. But we can look at this as a model um, to help us live in balance. I'm going to cruise through here because this is the interactive one. So I know many of us on this call right now are probably multitasking, and we're probably on Facebook or we're checking our emails. <laughs> but if we could come back to um, the, the PowerPoint, and in particular, this sheet that's called How Well Am I? So this is actually an assessment tool that we can use um, to assess our own well-being. So if you wouldn't mind, um, on a piece of paper, if you could just use the whole piece of paper and draw this image on your paper. So the outer circle, the inner circle, and then divide it into the four equal quadrants. And then you can label it physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. And then part of the assessment is on the inner, on the inner circle, closest to the um, where it intersects in the very center, you are going to write down a few things in each of the quadrants that you do well. So maybe you exercise and you drink water for the physical one. Um, and then you're going to fill in a couple for the mental, a couple for the emotional, a couple for the spiritual, things that you do well right now. And then on the outer circle, um, write down a couple of things in each quadrant that you would like to work on to help you live better in balance. Um, so maybe under emotional, as an example, you're going to um, r start writing in a journal or you're going to, you know, talk to, talk to friends or something like that. So go ahead and fill, take, a few, take a minute or two and fill out this how well am I.
And as you're filling this out, this is um, this handout is a resource that's that's listed on here. So feel welcome to copy it off and and use it. And as you're filling this out, I would also put the date on it, today's date, and check in with yourself um, next week, next month, um, and maybe even fill it out again just to kind of check where where you're at. And then the other way that you can use this tool is by sharing it with someone. You can think about bringing this tool into a staff meeting, for example, and having all of the staff members fill this out and then share it. Share it with a team member or every single person shares it. So oftentimes when we say things out loud to other people, that just helps in terms of um, the accountability, of the accountability to ourselves and the accountability to our team member that we shared it with. So that's another way that you can use this tool in the workplace, bringing it into a staff meeting. Or, you know, many of you are doing trainings out there in, in, your, in your communities, I mean, bringing it there as well. Okay, so I'm going to cruise along. All right. So oftentimes um, when we experience trauma, one of the behaviors that are associated with it is um, being, you know, over responsible, and um, which sometimes contributes to, you know, working 60 hours a week, and you know, all of this kind of stuff. Which then we then expect that of our staff, and you know, self care does not become a priority because how can we care for ourselves when we have all these things to do? So, on this slide, you'll see just several examples of self self care in the workplace. And more importantly, it's about your workplace culture, if you will, and really realizing if we are integrating self-care into the workplace or not. So for example, I have a colleague who in their workplace, they travel a lot, and they are expected to work while they are flying in the airplane. And you know, before, that was her time to like sleep to <laughs> rejuvenate herself before she before she got back to work. So it's like, what are what are our expectations of ourselves and our our fellow coworkers? So on this list, there's just um, some things that we can do alone. There's things that we can do with each other. Um, I'm not going to read every single one because you can you can you can read that yourself. But even if you could you print this off and you know stick it on a wall or something just as some reminders of just simple things that don't cost a lot, if anything, that, that we can integrate um, into our, our daily routines. So the next slide then um, is examples of self-care at home. So when we start creating a culture of self-care for ourselves, we can definitely expand it beyond the workplace. So these are just some other examples that we can do at home. And when we talk about self-care, these are things, conversations that we can bring into our home. These are conversations that we can bring into the workplace as well. So maybe part of that conversation might be brainstorming other ways that we can practice self-care at home, brainstorming other ways that we can bring self-care into the workplace as well. And then just... Oh, never mind. Okay, this is another um, tool that you can use. So the answer to trauma is healing. The answer to trauma is healing. And healing, interestingly, um, in the English language, heal, H-E-A-L, is a Hebrew-derived word. And if you were going to look it up, um, it would... The Hebrew definition means to become whole, to become whole. And we know from a Native perspective that that means to become whole physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. So that is what we call like the Native Wellness Foundation. Um, so what this healing plan does then is a tool to help us to work on our healing. 
So many of us are motivated to work in this movement because of our own personal experiences. And oftentimes that personal experience includes our own trauma that, that we have experienced. And so sometimes, um, or not sometimes, but when we hear that word being trauma-informed, part of what that means is certainly looking at the perspective of what's wrong with you versus what happened to you. It's having a profound understanding of trauma on behavior, but part of being trauma-informed is also doing our own personal healing work. So when we do our own personal healing work, that gives us the, the resiliency to, to do this work, and it's heavy, it's heavy work. And that's why you know, self-care is so important. So this healing plan, then, is just a tool to help us really map out what are we doing to help ourselves heal physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. So again, you can print this off um, and fill it out, put a date on it, and you know, check, check back with yourself. Because sometimes if we're not healing, we're hurting. And we're hurting sometimes ourselves or sometimes we're even hurting other people without knowing it. And by focusing on the healing, you know, I'm, I'm going to be 51 next month. And I've been doing this kind of work since I was 19. And I still have the same, you know, energy and passion um, to, to be of service to my people. And in part, that comes from because I do focus on self-care and I do focus on my healing. And I understand that healing is a journey and it's not a destination. So many people are like, oh, I filled out the healing plan. Check, you know, I'm, I'm done. But, but things continually happen in our lives, right, where, where we need to work on our own healing. Thank you so much, um, Jillian. I'm sorry, did I interrupt you? Oh, yeah, nope, that's fine. But, yeah, that's, I just wanted to go through this really quickly. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here, and thank you to all the participants on here and for the, for the awesome uh, work that you do for your community. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing the strength of your experience. Um, and that was really gr um, very interesting, helpful. Um, I think now what we are going to do is um, turn it over to Becky Masaki um, to talk about incorporating self-care. Yes, hello everybody. Uh, this is Becky, and thank you so much, Father Jeff and Jolene, for your wonderful information, insights, and your generous sharing. And much appreciation, um, just like Jolene said, I have a shout out for this. Um, I see in the chat box so many of you that I know and those that I don't know, I just really welcome you um, for joining this Compassion Fatigue and Self-Care webinar. Um, so in this third section, I'm going to focus on bringing self-care into our staff and organizational practices. And, um, you know, the, um, to, to think about this, it's overcoming challenges and really being our full, whole, dimensional selves and giving our strongest, most meaningful contributions to create peace, wellness, and love. The essential ingredient is self-care. And many of us, um, like I like to use the term radical self-care. And that's a term simply to mean, um, let's see, I'm just moving here. Um, it's just a term simply to remind us that self-care is not a luxury or something extra, but it's the care we give to ourselves and one another to truly create and be the social change we seek. You know, in our field, a common well-intentioned pitfall is that we work ourselves into a state of overwork, burnout, a framework that thinks of this as like extra and not worthy of our limited time and resources. Um, I like to remember, you know, what Thomas Merton said back in what, the 15th century um, that the frenzied actions that we throw ourselves into in our desperate desire to create a world of peace and justice 
kills the very root of our activism. And so these are all ways to just remind ourselves in a gentle way, but remind ourselves like, no, it's not something extra, but it's something that we really need to build in and integrate in the way that we intentionally do our work as advocates, um, as folks in this field and in this movement, and then build into our organization. So some practical ways that I want to, um, let's see, oh, okay, I just also like another quote. I quoted Thomas Merton, but another person that I like to, to keep in my mind and spirit is Audre Lorde. And she said, you know, I have come to believe that caring for myself is not self-indulgent. Caring for myself is an act of survival. And all of us are in that work to, um, to work with survivors, right? And so it's ourselves, not it's putting our own survival and our thriving in, in there as well, right? We need, we need that to be our best selves. Um, one of the ways that I want to share with you is physical practice. And um, this picture is showing how we do it in this example through Tai Chi that we did in cohort one of the move to end violence. And in that group, what we learned um, from Norma Wong um, is really reminding us and telling us that our, yes, our minds, our heads are connected to our body. And so in an intentional way, um, it's not just an extra thing, but it's really that interconnection of mind, body, spirit. And um, one of the ways was we did the Tai Chi, which was a way for us to be mindful about breathing um, and also to really, with intention, um, move. And we say we're, we all say, oh, yeah, we're for a movement build, building or we're movement makers, but do we move? A lot of times we're just um, sitting at our computers or doing a million different things in work or, um, you know, just rushing from one thing to another without that mindfulness and movement. So that's something that I really um, want all of us to put in our self-care plan and also our self-care plan, not another list of things that we have to do on our ever uh, unending calendars and um, ways, but no, more just that pause and that way to truly be um, fully in our present selves. Um, in a practical way, some of the things I wanted to talk about is like breathing space, so ways that you could um, work that into your um, workplace and with your staff. One of them was that we had staff, we were all working a million times per minute and we'd have very heavy, very hard work and then we'd just like, okay, get into the car or go take our cab or taxi or walk home and then boom, People were waiting for us. Our kids are rushing to pick the kids up from childcare or school or our elder parents. And um, they were all clamoring and happy to see us. And, you know, so like then you're, boom, you're into that or just cooking. And, you know, so it's just rush from work to home to work to home. Um, and where is the self-care? And then we felt like, oh, well, we're not worthy for that or we don't have the time. So what I did um, at my workplace that I would like to suggest and also hear from you what you've done is build in a little breathing space. So one example was I asked um, one of the staff, I said, you know, when you end here, just um, end one hour early of your work and that last hour is still on your work time. It's still paid work time, but just take a walk or take a breathing space, or go look outside. Um, whatever it takes for you to just, you know, have some breathing space time. And then from there, go home. And you don't have, you know, your work ends, say, at 5 o'clock, and then you take the, the bus home to your work, and then you're there for them. 
And just that small hour break time really did wonders of us being able to be in the present moment, be our most powerful selves at work, breathing space, and then at home. Um, so something seems very simple, but yet really important. So really build those in, in an intentional way into your work. I, I would say it's worked wonders. Um, another thing is work schedules. Um, I know at DV Shelters, um, we had, for example, you know, this happened to me. Working in the shelter is like inevitably went on my way home when I walked out the door at the shelter, like, you know, um, um, residents, oh, Becky, our kids, oh, Becky, can you help me with this or what's this, or pouring out their, their hardest, saddest, um, you know, struggle. And of course, you just can't walk out the door, and I needed to sit and listen or do some problem solving together, those kinds of things. Um, and then, consequently, I would be there for five more hours or something like that. So I feel like really being intentional and building that in, in a self-care way, into our organization. So what I would do is, for example, um, put maybe some of our staff think about, okay, can we do a four, four 10-hour days and take one whole day off, like not show up, just one whole day off. And it's okay, our, our coverage is cut, you know, we make a schedule so we have coverage there, but sometimes just working at home that day or just not even working and, you know, just arranging our schedules in a way so that when we're present, we can be fully present, and when we're out, we really have some breathing space. So those are just small tips, but things to just be intentional about and think about. And also to have those conversations and not make assumptions. So like just to let you know, um, and one example was for me, a self-care movement is walks. I love to have walks and I love nature. And I think it is also especially for us that live in a city or a crowded place, it's kind of nice to just take a walk around the park or something like that or, you know. Um, and I, um, I said, yeah, let's take a walk, you know, and I did that with a coworker who was a refugee um, during the Southeast Asian times, and that's what brings her um, from Cambodia and the Hill Tribes to the U.S. And when we did those walks that I thought were just so wonderful in nature, for her it was triggering the escape um, during a war. Um, during what they in Vietnam called the American War, um, of the escape through through the forest to to escape and for their survival. So for me, a walk in the forest or in nature was a time of refuge and safety. And for her, it actually triggered her escape. So for different people, it is different things. And maybe sometimes even just being mindful of that helps us to interrupt those um, unconscious habits and be intentional and mindful. It is what we call mindfulness that really helps us be our strongest self. So I know that we are um, towards the time, time ending. Um, I have a, a million different little tips of ways that we can, um, with intention, change some of the ways that we've structured our organizations and we've structured our staff and we structure ourselves. Um, but I think that with, with time now, let's go into, I think I'll turn it back over into for Jennifer um, so that we can take questions and answers. I'll just end with this last thing, a reminder to us that you know, peace, liberation, the things we talk about are lifelong practices. And to sustain ourselves in this work, we must care for ourselves and one another in this movement. And what that means is being tough enough to hear the harshest truths and at the same time being vulnerable enough to let those truths 
inside. So it means fierce determination and generous compassion. And as we um, end this call or wind up, do our questions and answers, um, let's practice that peace within ourselves and among others as we build our community to where we are now. We challenge ourselves within a gentle love to look and think in these ways that will be about self-care and self-thriving. Uh, Becky, if you, um, you do have a couple of minutes still if you wanted to do the, um, the, the activity. Um, we do have a couple of minutes if you want to do that. Oh, yeah. OK, great that we have some time. This I learned um, from uh, Lorena. She shared, so I want to share this with you all. Um, let's practice. So this is something you could take into your workplace and others. I see you. I celebrate. I love you. These three things are a way to talk and practice with, each other, with ourselves and each other. And right now, in this moment, let's just pick this one. I celebrate you. On the chat box, let's, um, please, I invite you to chat in. What do you celebrate? So celebrate yourselves and others. What do you celebrate? What are some things we celebrate right now? I want to hear that. Fill in that chat box. I want to hear some celebration. And I feel like also like that is really uh, essential. It's not a luxury. It's not fluff or not just to be nice to somebody, but truly to be our strongest selves. We do need to um, not just look with the, all of that, um, the, what we put in and all the attention and time we put onto the trouble and what's wrong. What if we take a few minutes to think about what's right? What are we celebrating? What's going good? And be proud. Don't be over humble. Yes, yeah, so I'm seeing that nature, resilient self, your children, your people, every day taking it well. So I invite everyone to look at the chat box and contribute. Thank you. Um, so these are beautiful to see, everyone's comments. I'm loving them. I've been reading everyone's comments as you're going um, and thinking about things that you celebrate and, and things that you love. And um, thank you so much to uh, Becky for that piece. Um, so we do know um, from the registration that about 20% of you are practicing self-care already. Um, so that leaves a lot of room for the rest of us to, to start doing some, um, taking some measures to take care of ourselves. Um, and so we have um, time now for questions or comments. So if you would like to pose a question to um, the faculty, you can do that. Or else, um, if you would like to share with us um, things that you are already doing, that would work as well. So. Uh, we have, I just saw a question coming up. Um, we had a, a little under 500 participants for this call. I see that Catherine had asked, what is the 20% of? Um, we had about a little less than 500. I think the number was 470 something uh, in terms of participants. Um, Moni, is there a special directions for folks if they need to, if they want to ask the question verbally? Um, no, I think I had not been able to show the, the questions, but now it's open. I, I don't know if everybody can see the questions now. These are the questions that we have. Are they on the screen? Can you see them? Okay. Yes. Uh, folks, I see some folks. Um, sharing what they celebrate still. Um, I see one question here. Any suggestions on checking in with staff when 
staff are very mobile and not in office very much. Um, I wonder if um, Father Jeff or Becky or, or Delene has any comments on that. Well, this is Father Jeff. Um, we, we put in, we were always making sure that we were having supervision weekly. And so folks could be mobile, but we always uh, adhered uh, and made sure we took care of that connection and did not give up that time or space. So we could do that via phone, obviously. Usually it's better to do it in person. But um, uh, we made sure that we were checking in uh, with each other, uh, not just in supervision, but uh, throughout, we had a whole series of ways that we would do that throughout the day, the way we began, and then the way we would also begin meetings. Um, but we would never not let that happen. Did, any I other thoughts? Um, go ahead, Becky. Oh, yeah. I was thinking that, you know, in this virtual times that we have, um, it is also good to be mindful about some old-fashioned ways to do in-person work. So just being intentional or thoughtful about it, you know, is it quarterly, depending on the structure of your organization, like build into that, like what are the times that we can come together? You know, is it quarterly or uh, certain times or, and then where, you know? Sometimes it's not necessarily the office. So for example, I host something at my house. I'm not saying everybody has to do that, but you know, that is something, or sharing a meal together, or those kinds of things that just, um, bring us into connection, also virtually, right? There's lots of platforms for um, uh, virtu virtual ways that we can be together. So that just being intentional about that, I think, is important. Um, I see, um, Jillene, that there was a question as well um, that was sent to you a little bit earlier. To, to explain the difference between um, mental and emotional in terms of your tools that you were demonstrating? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when we think about mental, we think about um, like our brains and the way we think. And so examples might include, um, you know, reading and the, type, the types of things that we're reading, you know, going to trainings where we're learning and, you know, things like that. And emotional has to do more with our emotions. So our you know, do we have people that we can talk to and confide in? You know, are we there for other other people? Um, you know, do we like ourselves? Do we love ourselves? And you know, things like that. And self love really is the the basis of self care. So if we love ourselves, um, which which sometimes you know many of us have a difficulty doing. When we love ourselves, then we're going to take care of ourselves. And so. Those are, those are a few examples of how to um, differentiate that. And then I just wanted to also comment on um, checking in with staff that are, that are mobile. So, of course, someone already talked about the phone. Um, so we can, we can text people. We can use social media to, to check in with people. Um, so those are, those are just a few examples as well. We can have buddy systems even in, in the workplace of people who are going to check in with each other about their self-care, so it doesn't always have to be a supervisor, as, as an example. Um, and then, let's see, there was another question. I'm, I'm not seeing it right now, but um, the other part, oh, somebody, somebody had a question about when they go on walks, they have to clock out and, that, and then clock back in when they come back in, so that, that, you know, oftentimes prevents them from doing that. So this is where you know, directors, our program managers really assess your policies for self-care because sometimes our, our own policies are preventing self-care. So sometimes we need to just review that and, and maybe do an overhaul of our policies that prevent self-care. So sometimes workplaces will introduce like wellness time and, you know, give people 15 to 30 minutes a day for their wellness time and it's up to them the kind of activities, you know, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually that they want to focus on for their self-care as an example of self-care related policies. Um, I wonder if um, Father Jeff, in, in, um, along that same 
line um, of what Jelena is sharing about things that you sort of incorporate um, in terms of if you're a supervisor or if you're um, managing the organization. You had mentioned to me in preparation for this some things that you did as a supervisor to help incorporate it um, in the workplace. Could you maybe share some of that as well? Uh, you mean besides uh, self-care plans? It, like speaking with your staff and ways that you've helped them sort of incorporate about their own self-care plans, yeah. Um, well, as I said, we, we, we all had a self-care plan. Everybody was um, asked to create their own self-care plan, so I showed you an example of mine. They're very different, right? And I think that what was important for us was to realize that there's something between, we made the distinction between self-care, so ongoing, right, something that you do ongoing, uh, to uh, keep your tire inflated, keep you prepared, and what we would call a safety plan. So a safety plan would be that you would get triggered in the moment, right? Something would happen, you might get overwhelmed, someone would say something to you. And we also had safety plans that would help people re-regulate, right? So it was really important to understand that if you're around radiation and you get dosed with radiation, what do you need to do? That's a very different kind of plan and an ongoing one that would help hopefully prevent you from being filled up with radiation, right, filled up with toxic stress. So it was important for us to actually make the distinction. So, you know, we would wear lanyards with our IDs, and on the back people actually had safety plan steps that they would take if they felt really angry or filled up or overwhelmed. The self-care plan was meant to actually help people, if you will, have the capacity to move and use their safety plan. When we were working with young people, lots of times that was one of the very first questions or we would ask folks at HopeWorks after a while was how do you know when you're angry or you're upset? And many of our clients didn't know. They just didn't know. And so, you know, just beginning to be able to have the familiarity with your own sense of, of, of what's happening, what you're feeling, your body, right? So much has been dissociated, these kind of things is such a first step. We have to make sure that also our employees have an awareness of what's going on with themselves um, also. So those were a couple things that we did. We also would begin each meeting uh, with three basic questions. So how are you feeling? What's your goal? And who can help you with that? And the, and the idea there was to work with the emotional brain and the rational brain to begin by saying simply to acknowledge whatever's going on, right? So I'm feeling happy, I'm feeling sad, whatever. If someone said they were angry, you might say, can I check in with you afterwards? It wasn't somehow to fix things, right? It was to acknowledge it. Again, think about the zebra. It was, in a sense, to get back from the emotional piece back to your rational brain, which we don't have access to if we're hyper-aroused, right? Our emotional brain, our limbic system will take over. So then the idea was to be able to name one thing you could work on, concrete, rooting yourself in today, and then to create safety that there's somebody in the room who can help you do that, that you can rely on, right, to be connected. So we had a number of different procedures like that that I think work together. The idea is that self-care is not something that you do by yourself, especially in organizational life. We're a group of brains, so we have to create lots of different um, strands to help us manage, you know, the environment we're in, the person we are, and then the issues that are in kind of the society that we're working Great, thank you. Um, I see a question that popped up a little while ago, um, and it says, what is sanctuary? Um, and I think that was something that came up, if I recall, um, in Father Jeff's presentation. Sure. Yeah, so sanctuary is a, uh, a program um, that is um, a trauma-informed approach to organizations. So it really... Um, uh, applies many um, of the techniques that I'm talking about and the principles to organizational life with the understanding that, um, you know, the only way in which we can really help the people that we want to help, the DV, the homeless, the young people like that risk youth that I was working with, is to make sure that we actually create safety. And to create safety begins with the people who are working there. And so it really focuses on the staff first, creating the safety, the container, so that people can come in and, in a sense, be unsafe with you. They're going to come in, just like the example of Folletti's uh, 
the woman who uh, gained uh, the weight, Patty, who gained the weight back. You're, when we're working in this environment, you know, in a sense, we're going to have to be working with vomit, and we don't want to be vomit adverse because the people that we're working with actually have learned incredible survival habits that are really strengths. They help them survive, but they can be uh, pretty tough to be around. And so again, sanctuary really helps us not be vomit adverse, but rather in a sense to actually see those moments as the opportunities of engagement with people. You know, again, my example earlier was an emergency room where someone would come in bleeding and in a sense we would send them home come back to the emergency room when you're not bleeding. No, we, through sanctuary, saw that as an opportunity, that behavior, as the opportunity uh, to begin healing. So sanctuary helped us do that. If there's a lot online, we could put a link up about that. Great. Um, I have a comment that has popped up um, that I will open to, to the faculty to respond to. Um, and it says, um, we've had staff meetings that lasted two hours, um, the first half was work, and the second half was a lot of laughter and what we considered bonding. Recently, we were told to cut down on our meeting times. Do you think the hour we laugh and bond would be considered self-care? Yes. <laughs> this is Becky. <laughs> yes. I, I, I totally feel like that's not extra. And again, you know, the, thank you for sharing that example. Um, it's just very common, you know, that we in the domestic violence, sexual assault, um, you know, mm -hmm. violence against women kinds of work, we um, think, oh, that's, we don't have enough time for that. That would be, you know, we just have to cut back to one hour staff meeting or something like that. But really to be our full selves and our most strongest and best, we have to. It's not extra. It is an important aspect that we have, those breathing spaces, you know. And when you look at it in the big picture, one hour during the staff time is not a lot of, you know, time. It's definitely worthwhile work, paid work time. So so my definitely. mind would be really to find ways that you could continue and support that. Yeah, Can and this is... Mrs. Deline, I just wanted to comment really quick on that as well. So, you know, just when we talk about reprogramming, reprogramming our brain, you know, laughter um, releases endorphins in our bodies that make us feel good. And so it is a stress reliever. And so part of what laughter does and, you know, exercise and getting outside and other stuff is like we're shifting and we're moving the energy that <clears throat> is often stored up in our in our bodies from from grief and loss and you know, all, all this kind of stuff. So laughter really is good medicine. As, as is sitting with your, with your colleagues and, you know, sharing a meal or whatever. So, yeah, that's definitely um, self-care. Great. Um, we have a couple more minutes for questions. Um, I see one up that is related to ACE scores, and it says, uh, would it be beneficial to have a new person who is hired take the test to identify, uh, to immediately identify the self-care process? So, I, I mean, uh, this is Father Jeff. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I think it's really delicate, uh, the ACE, uh, the ACE uh, questionnaire, right? And uh, just because, again, we take the test, doesn't mean we know what to do with it. And it can be incredibly uh, 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 triggering to people. So I, I've given this oftentimes, uh, I'll go over it in presentations, and it's really powerful for some people just to be able to name what's happened. So we, like we had a young man in my program who would go to the hospital three and four times a week. And I mean, he was able to, everything was the matter with him. He was going to the emergency room, blah, blah, blah. And through the program, through our program, he basically began to reduce his hospital visits to about once every eight weeks. It was a pretty amazing thing he used to carry around a box of drugs. And uh, I remember when he met Dr. Folletti, Dr. Folletti came to Camden and talked. One of the things that Jose said, just stunning, he goes, before I learned about this, I just thought this was how life was. 
And I find that that's what oftentimes happens when people first see the ACE questions, if they haven't had exposure to this, that this kind of behavior is expected and normal. It's understood as just something that I, is part of life, and I figured out how to work with. Uh, and so it can, it can a lot of times be overwhelming, surprising. Um, you know, people can have a very strong reaction to it because uh, they can be defensed up about who did it to them, what was done to them, right? So a very, very powerful thing. It also can lead to folks being able to name that they're engaged in the same behavior. So there's a, there's a great film called Still Face where it's an experiment where a mom – you know, goes quiet and looks at her baby, and the baby gets very apoplectic, gets very upset, and then the mom smiles and the baby calms down. If you haven't seen this, very powerful. We use that to talk about ACEs for neglect. And I remember one young woman saw that, and then she just turned and said, oh, my gosh, that's what I do to my son every night. Right? Well, it wasn't that she's a bad person. She's simply doing that which was done to her, which she learned how to survive. Right? Somebody asked a question earlier about Adrian Peterson and, you know, the child abuse kind of uh, things that happened to him later after, after he was hurt. And he, 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 he hit his son with a switch. And what he said was that was what he understood was correct. Right? I think the really powerful thing about ACEs is it really reaffirms, like Patty, that people, we, are very adaptive and are strength-based. It's just that we oftentimes adapt behaviors that are very harmful, but they help us survive and they can hurt other people. So I think it brings out a lot of empathy. So ACE, doing the ACE questionnaire with just somebody as an employee, I wouldn't do that. I would do that in a, uh, in a much broader kind of context so that people could be supported by it. That's just what I thought. I don't know what others think. Thank you very much, Bob, Jeff. Um, so at this time, um, I would like to first just say thank you to our, our wonderful faculty, um, Jolene, Becky, and Father Jeff, who are here with us today to share all of their great experience and knowledge on this topic. And um, what we have now on the screen is a self-care commitment. And so what we are providing to you both um, here on the screen um, and in the tools um, that are available is this opportunity to think about how you will make a commitment to um, do self-care for, for yourself and within the organization, um, and to think about what you can integrate into your work day um, and week to really take care of yourself, and what steps you can take to create a culture of self-care in the organization. Um, a really important aspect of this is to think about a buddy or to think about um, a person who can support this work for you within your organization, within your life. Um, we have checklists available. Um, we have here on the slide um, a self-care um, tool for individuals and organizations, which is a commitment plan for personal self-care um, as well as um, in the workplace. So we do encourage you to take advantage of that, um, to think about using that in your lives and at work. Um, we have a list of resources. Um, please do check them out. Um, there's a lot of resources on this subject uh, available here and then also widely available. Um, so we encourage you to take a look about that. Um, we thank you so very much for being part of this webinar. Um, if you have any questions that we were not able to answer or additional questions or would like additional information, please do contact Monica. Uh, her email is listed here on the slide. Um, and it's, it's very important to us if you can take a moment to complete the short evaluation about the webinar. As I said, we really do take your comments seriously. They're very important to us. Um, and, and we do incorporate your suggestions. So please do um, do that evaluation. Again, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. And I would like to thank again Father Jeff, Jolene, and Becky for sharing their, um, their information with us and for being here with us. Thank you so much.